Hello there, welcome back to the Agassino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agassino Zinger, and this is episode number 485 of the Agassino Zinger Show. I'm hoping it's 485. If it's not 485, there might be 486, but I'm pretty sure it's 485. I'm going to double check my phone and make sure it's 485. It should be 485. No, it's not. It's 486. It's 486 on the Agassino Zinger Show. Welcome back. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's a pleasure to have your company. Even though I get the episode numbers wrong, I'm still grateful that you are here sharing this time with me. If it's your first time checking out the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash a like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. That'd be more than welcome. If you're listening via the podcast app, please leave me a five-star review and share the show with all your family and friends. I'd be more than grateful for that. And of course, support via Patreon is welcome too. Go in the show notes description down below. You'll find a link there to my Patreon at patreon.com forward Agostino, subscribe on there for as one pound equivalent of one dollar per month, and you get access to my entire bonus content on Patreon. Get involved, subscribe on there today. I would very much appreciate it. Yes, we're back. I had to record this three or four times. The intro that's why I'm steamrolling it through. You won't have known this if you listen to it right now, but unfortunately, my MacBook Air is on its last legs, it's just about dying on the way to dying, and I'm thankful that it's only dying now because I just managed to secure myself full time employment. Because usually whenever, you, whenever you're whenever you out of work or you your money's a bit tight, usually that's when stuff around you starts breaking. You're like, oh my God, if there's a God up there, you are playing games on me. But finally, thankfully, it broke just about or it's, it's kind of approaching its breaking point just as I'm, you know, getting my feet under the table at a new full-time gig that I finally managed to cure in the last couple of weeks. So I'm over the moon for that. So nice happy okay with it because i know even if it breaks i know there's income coming in i can pay for it of course i can pay for it now i've got savings but no one wants to spend their savings to recover a macbook because if you know anything about macbooks and especially macbook airs you think it's one issue you 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 take it to go get repaired and then you find out there's seven other issues and then suddenly you go from spending a hundred quid to spending nearly 300 and you're thinking to yourself should I just bin this and brick it and get a Dell or what yeah you know I mean it's a real mad conundrum so I'm thankful I'm over the moon that hasn't broken on me just yet um if I'm not mistaken I think the issue at hand is the battery the battery is dead essentially I have to keep the computer plugged in in order for it to stay awake if it's not plugged in it doesn't stay awake so I think that's the issue at hand if I get the battery replaced then I'm pretty sure I should be in a much better place just need to get the battery replaced and I'll be fine but again that costs money that costs time to you know be about the computer and then get a little covering one for the time being so now I'm in a much better place I'm thankful and the timing for this couldn't be better and I can now get it fixed going forward as I mentioned briefly, um, I finally managed to secure myself uh, full-time employment, which is pretty good considering I've been looking for the best part of what, under a year. Um, for the most part, the idea prior to COVID, obviously everyone's changes and dreams and whatnot has completely changed off the back of this pandemic. But the idea of what I was trying to do prior was obviously, you know, I was in a good position with this podcast. The things are going really well and I was really push pumping out the videos and making sure I was recording at least three times per week and just banging stuff out uploading stuff on Patreon all the time and then of course on the side as well I was DJing mostly I'd say in any given week sometimes three times per week which is bloody amazing it allowed me to improve my level really good and obviously it allowed me to have a little bit of extra income on top of that it's not much it can range between 50 to 100 pound but still those little extra bits on top it definitely goes a long way in terms of you looking in the month thinking wow I've got a lot more money than I usually have and I didn't realize the time that it was me going super hard at the podcast and super hard with DJing and then obviously thinking about um, hosting exhibitions and doing other bits and bobs and putting on parties I was looking okay cool there's always avenues that I can kind of explore my creative yearnings that could also kind of help me bolster my financial position going forward but then of course COVID happens and suddenly those main I won't say main but especially the DJing part and maybe the podcasting part for the most part because I was trying to focus on making sure I can find a gig were basically undercut for me the podcast is a thing mostly because I found, not sure if you guys are the same, but I found whenever I've got other things in real life that I'm kind of worrying about that I want to get right, it sometimes can affect the work that I do, whether it's working nine to five, whether it's, you know, creative stuff I do outside of it. It can make you like, I don't know, it can sometimes affect your drive and your motivation. Obviously, it's not the best way to do it because I think when you're in like a really bad position in your life, it probably is the best time to kind of, you know, um, 
check yourself deeply into whatever art project that you're doing because usually your best work comes around at times but I found for me personally it was just a struggle to get that going um so that kind of affected it in in one in one space and also I just went to focus and make sure I got the gig sorted out and I had that position all nicely buttoned up but has to be said for anybody out there who's also struggling to find gigs don't take it personally it's not just you it's everybody um I work mostly within like what what would you say the marketing industry side of things and I have to be honest like even though I've got pretty decent experience I found it incredibly difficult to get a job incredibly it's just so hard don't even get me started on like normal customer service stuff like even working in retail that's like you know those jobs are really few and far between I think the real kind of amazing point for you to have got one of those kind of jobs to kind of pay the bills and make sure you keep the lights on was at the beginning of the pandemic when everyone was I think there was a rush to find people just to fill the gigs because obviously they didn't have enough people in the stores to fulfill demand everyone was buying toilet paper that rush in the beginning if you didn't get in there it's pretty hard to get in there now because now you know for the most part the ones who are the ones who have the experience are getting a priority the places now have kind of you know gotten into their groove and their routine most places don't really need too many staff on the shop floor to make it work especially with the you know with the with the kind of a decrease in footfall in general i've seen outside so i think that's greatly affecting it but in terms of a nine to five working in the office they're really difficult to come by nowadays mostly partly well i guess mostly due to the pandemic and also because of the changing needs for a company now you don't need to be in the office anymore it effectively opens up employers um ability to go and hire you know far uh what should you call it, far better or far better? No, a broader range of candidates, right? They can interview more people. They don't need to just interview people specifically who live in a city where their head office is based. They can go and kind of cast a net far and wide, which allows them obviously to get better candidates, but obviously in that respect also increases the competition for you and I. So it makes it far more difficult for you and I to find those positions. But if you persevere and you just keep on keeping on, unfortunately, um, getting a job is similar to like doing push-ups and sit-ups and stuff in order for you to get nice arms arms and abs and whatever you don't know when the breaking point is going to come when you're suddenly going to cross over and you're going to start seeing the gains but the moment you stop the moment you break that momentum is a moment the gains go away forever so you just have to keep applying you have to keep checking and hopefully you'll get there but honestly don't be discouraged because i can legitimately say hand on heart it legitimately took me like a year to get this gig that i've got at the moment and if i'm honest it took me maybe I don't know, it was up to maybe the only the last, no, it was up to maybe eight months, 10 months when I started getting replies. There was time when I was applying where my application was just going into deep space. I wasn't even getting acknowledgement sometimes that I sent my application in. You'd be like, did what, did I write the cover letter wrong? What, do you know what I mean? You didn't even know what was going on, but I'd imagine that there's so much, like, I'd imagine most places are so inundated with applications. There are basically too many good candidates and not enough jobs around that they just don't have time to get back to everybody. Do you know what I mean? So sometimes you feel as if like you have the experience necessary to do X, Y, or Z job. And honestly, this competition is just too far, too much. Like I'm saying, like I've got fairly good experience. I've done some fairly decent stuff along my kind of working career and I'm finding it difficult. I can only imagine what people below me in terms of experience and knowledge base and also above me are feeling right now. So I'm I'm thankful that happened like i said um I, i've never really been the biggest proponent um of kind of uh sharing this sort of stuff it's not really necessary it's not important but just in terms of what we're going through in the pandemic it's um i think it's important to basically let people know that you know those struggles that you're going through you're not alone everyone's kind of going through them together and unfortunately this is just the way of the world at the moment do you know what i mean so it is no real point to kind of beat yourself up and get all down in the dumps because effectively this is happening to literally everybody and i'd imagine it kind of varies in different um industries i think obviously in the marketing side of things there's just you know for the most part most of those jobs are bullshit jobs anyway you don't really need people to sit there and monitor facebook accounts and share you know funny tweets on flipping whatever it may be or funny bits of content on your social media feed there's a bit of a nonsense job type something specific is sitting down and doing that role so if anything if you're a big company and you've got some you know wits about you you just get the marketing manager who's got experience to basically fulfill the role of doing the community's manager side of things the social media side of things and their job itself do you know what i mean you just get them to do free and maybe bump their salary up a little bit and that's way to get around it so if you're a if you're kind of a specialist social media manager you're going to find it difficult if you're a specialist community manager you're going to find it difficult but if you're able to kind of maybe be a jack of all trades and kind of you know roll your sleeves up and do a bit of the kind of quote ugly work and maybe do things that are outside of your 
your remit of expertise maybe you're good on sales all that kind of stuff you're going to increase your obviously your um possibility of being employed but in general it's a dogfight out there it really is it's hard it's difficult you just kind of keep on it like i was applying or looking at least every day i couldn't apply every day because there weren't jobs available every day um but i was constantly um, looking just checking to make sure because um even though i have a decent amount of savings i was kind of specking stuff like that's a good thing about covid the great thing about covid has been for someone like myself who's always kind of operating on a day's notice right i never really fought further ahead than a, a day if anything i was kind of you know um uh that was sort of my claim to fame in that regard of how i handled everyday life but i found with covid and with the lockdown it made me kind of relax sit down and maybe think a bit long term and when i specking out my savings i thought you know what i could obviously have this and be okay and survive until a year but i didn't want to be in a position where i was going to deplete all my savings i worked really hard to save up i wanted to still have a, a nice amount of income coming in and obviously with the ability to work remotely there wasn't really any risk or it wasn't really taken away from anything i was doing you know myself outside of work um that that i shouldn't go for it because that was the one thing that was kind of putting me off i was thinking that if i go back into full-time employment it's going to affect the things i'm going to do outside of work but you know what this is grown up time if it's going to affect the things i'm going to do outside of work it's going to affect it i just have to figure it out and make sure i find a solution that works best for me and go from there really there is no time to really kind of fuck around for lack of a better term sorry for the swearing and whatnot but yeah um finally got it secured again i, I think if i looked at a list of applications i must have sent over 100 it's been about a year i've just got a, a secured a role now and only in the last eight months or so did i finally get replies even from applications so if it's a bit dark out there for you and you're feeling a little bit blick a little bit down don't be it's not just happening to you specifically it's happening to everybody out there it's hard it's a dogfight but you just have to wake up every day and just try your best to keep applying put yourself through the rigmarole go through the interviews all that kind of lucky and then I'm, ho I'm, ho I'm hopeful um that you will find um a position for yourself as well and now that the world's reopening up again like i said i think it's more of a timing thing as well because i was consistently on it my rental was building up and also the world reopened i think it's no coincidence that i've just secured a role now because again things are getting back to some semblance of normality companies are seeing you know that they still have gaps in there maybe um you know in the employee roster they still got a position need to fill they've got work that needs to be you know i'm done and if you're ready and willing and able you'll get the gig but yeah that's been it so i'm over the moon for that as you can tell over the bloody moon so moving on moving on moving on jam pack show to get in today loads of stuff to talk about so give yourself a drink or whatever you need to do and let's jump right on in so number one spare a thought for harry kane spare a thought for harry kane man i feel don't get me wrong i, I do feel bad for him I do feel bad and I don't feel bad. I don't feel bad for him more so because of the circus that surrounds it and the excuses made for, for him, you know, vis-a-vis -vis from like people like Gary Neville and whatnot and the kind of double standard that exists in kind of the English sports media in general when it comes to appraising or critiquing players who are domestic football players, you know, but mostly British football players vis-a-vis -vis foreign players, whatever it may be. I feel like that's a little bit out of order because it's like as other people, other people have mentioned, if this situation with Harry Kane happened with Paul Pogba where he specifically basically went on strike and said he's not going to come into work and basically went on sky sports news and did an interview with one of the leading broadcasters or on there and gary neville and basically declared that he wanted to leave and put a price tag on his own head then i think a lot of people would have a lot of very rude and insulting and somewhat racial things to say to paul pogba but because it's harry kane and supposedly he's a saint according to gary neville everyone is excusing his bullshit behavior but on the other side i also kind of feel bad for him as a professional because even though he signed the contract himself under no under no duress no one put a gun to his head and he signed an eight-year deal i think or something like that or six-year deal in 2018 he's still one of the best if not one of the best strikers in europe playing at the moment and if he stays any longer at tottenham he's not going to win a trophy and he hasn't won one so far and um time is really ticking father time is ticking um and another year i think he turns 29 or 28 or something along those kind of lines he's pretty i won't say injury prone but he does miss at least a couple of a couple of months in each season um um, with some sort of injury he's not the most mobile or athletic of players even though he holds up the ball well and all that malarkey so all these things will negatively affect him the more time goes on and the inability of him to move to a bigger club or to a club that has the possibility of winning trophies but also on the other side if you're Daniel Levy right the owner of um 
what you call it, Tottenham, you don't want to sell Harry Kane because you know, more often than not, you're not going to be able to replace him with one player, let alone three. And also at this stage of the transfer window, you, there's no guarantee that you're going to be able to use the funds adequately to fill in the spots or the gaps that needed in your squad to ensure that they finish as high as they can in the league. So Harry Kane is in a weird position where Levy is basically saying, unless the team that you want to go to wants to sign you for 150 million plus, you're not going anywhere. And at this moment in time, when you consider that Haaland is going to be, what, 70 mil or something they said next season, Mbappe might move for free next season if he doesn't sign the deal. It doesn't make economic sense for either of those clubs to go for Harry Kane, spend 150 million from on him now, um, only for him to get injured a couple of months in the season already, when they could just wait um, a whole season and maybe get the possibility of signing two of the hottest striking prospects in Europe. But there's been another bigger announcement and revelation that's kind of really I would assume maybe made Harry Kane go into a bit of a uh, a bit of a depressive state at the moment um is this news courtesy of Sky Sports News says the following breaking Robert Lewandowski has um wants a new challenge away from Bayern Munich but the club has valued him at more than 100 million so out of nowhere out of completely nowhere left field Robert Lewandowski the leading goal scorer at Bayern Munich one of again one of the best strikers in Europe despite his age has now basically pulled you know, put out a come and get me plea for some of the top clubs in Europe and basically said, hey, I want a new challenge. I want something fresh. If I can get that now this season, because think about it too, if you're, if, if you're Robert Lewandowski, you probably want to move now this summer, then wait next summer because again, you know, Haaland and Mbappe will be on the market. So that's most likely going to lessen your chances of going to a top club that can challenge for trophies again. So you want to move now to kind of cash in, um, as much as possible and but obviously if you're Bayern Munich you don't want to let him go either but of course if you're Man City maybe Robert Lewandowski is a better stopgap now at his age than a Harry Kane he's definitely going to cost you far cheap he's definitely going to cost you far less than Harry Kane minus all the English tax and all that malarkey it makes it a good option for those teams to go for Robert Lewandowski now and maybe think you know what let's go for him now let it be a stopgap we'll have him for like a season maybe a season and a half get those other players to come in with him maybe learn from him in that half a season that he's here and then we transition over to the Haaland and the Mbappes I could definitely see that happening going forward but if you're Harry Kane you must be absolutely pulling out your hair at this state and then to make matters even more awkward um, Nuno Espirito Santo the new boss now at Spurs is basically is pointing out here in his headline courtesy of Sky Sports that he's going to make a decision on whether Harry Kane plays on Saturday. So I think he's trained a couple of days. He's probably not the requisite fitness levels to obviously play. But if this was any other season, they would have just let him get his fitness on the on the pitch, and he definitely would have played. But the fact that he is, you know, in this contracted, he's in this weird position where he's obviously trying to force his way out of the club, but he also doesn't want to annoy the fans. But it's also very clear that his time maybe has come to an end. But it's also very clear that the clubs that want to sign him aren't willing to pay the valuation that Tottenham are placed on him for obvious reasons. He's you no. Know, Santo is in a weird position because Terry Kane is clearly one of their best if not the best player at Spurs he would obviously love for him to play for him but he also is a new coach maybe it's a blessing that he wants to push for a move and he's able to maybe get good results with this current team because it's going to what was it called? It's going to solidify the faith the players have in Nuno in general. Do you know what I mean? So it's a really strange position to be in because if you bend over backwards and let Harry Kane back into a team, maybe the players will look at you a little bit of like a side eye, like, ah, oh, you know, he letting him walk all over you. But if you're able to maybe galvanize the squad members in terms of playing without this talisman, um, you know, at, at the at the front, I mean, sorry, at the, at the top of the pitch, maybe it's a great way of kind of, um, you know, uh, getting yourself acclimatized and getting yourself sort of linked and spiritually bonded with the players that you have at the moment. I don't know, man. It's a really mad time. Um, thoughts and feelings go out to Harry Kane and his advisors. I think in general, he was advised terribly. And now he's basically in a position that he basically did to himself. And he's got no one else to blame really in that regard. I don't think it's anyone else to blame. So let's not feel too sorry for him, especially considering that he's on, what, 170 grand or something stupid like that probably, isn't it? We don't want to get too crazy with the feeling of sorries. And then talking about feeling sorry for people that you really shouldn't be feeling sorry for, there's this crazy article here courtesy of Yahoo News regarding Lizzo, the much famed, the much fabled Lizzo. Somebody that I have a lot of time for musically. Oddly enough, I think she's a really good pop star. 
I just hate all the histrionics and the nonsense that goes uh, on with her outside of the music. The fact that her being fat is used as both a crux in order for her to gain notoriety, but it's also used as a defense mechanism whenever she feels like people are criticizing her for stuff that she should be criticized for, right? In general, it just feels a little bit strange that she uses it on both ends in that regard. But again, I guess the game is a game. It is what it is. But it's courtesy of Yahoo News. It says Lizzo cries during Instagram live in response to mean messages. It's fat phobic and it's racist and hurtful, which is bizarre. But let's continue and read the whole statement. It says fans, famous friends like Cardi B and Missy Elliott are cheering on Lizzo after the single cry during an honest moment on instagram live during a video which no longer appears on instagram feed the grammy award winner um, got emotional in response to negative attacks days after she and cardi b released the music video for her new song rumors on the days i feel i should be happier she says i feel so down um like i hurt so hard though the 33 year old man she's 33 years old crying on instagram like this about people saying mean things on, on the dms like just imagine what those 18 year olds are going through mate come on grow up anyway it continues says i'm not even going to say them um or, or to give them power she says um people saying shit about me that just doesn't make any sense she says visibly upset the fat phobic uh, it's racist and it's hurtful if you don't like my music cool if you don't like rumors the song cool but the people that don't like me because of the way i look no but that's the thing that i've never understood with lizzo right i don't think people i don't think she is okay with people not liking her music because i think pop stars like her or celebrities like her for some reason are in this are under a false guise or idea that somehow everybody is meant to like them and if you don't like them, then that is cause for them to cry and moan and complain about bullying online. That isn't the case. Like nowadays, especially, I feel like um, in order to become a really successful pop star at the level that she is, at the level that someone like a Cardi B is, you kind of need to have people who really dislike everything about you and what you stand for. You need to have as many people that love you as they hate you too, I think, in order for you to get to the real upper echelons. There's no way of getting to the top, top, top tier of stars them without having a dedicated group of people who are um who want nothing but to bring down your career and also people who will excuse just about everything that you do because they want you to be super successful you need both camps but for whatever reason lizzo doesn't believe that and if you criticize her as a fat phobic it's a racism thing which is insane and also this is a weird thing to say but isn't it kind of isn't there some sort of um i say some sort of doesn't it Aren't you in some sort of... That doesn't bring shapes. If you're Lizzo, right, and you're constantly floating yourself on social media, and it's not saying, oh, she deserves anything, just, just don't get me wrong, but this is what I'm going to say. If you're flaunting yourself on social media and you're bearing yourself, naked or not, online, regardless of what her body shape is, shouldn't you expect some level of pushback from some people who maybe don't vibe with it for whatever reason? Whether it's because you're fat or not, whatever. You should expect some pushback, right? And if that's the case... The whole point of it is that you don't let that pushback influence what you want to do. If the, if that's how you want to live your life, if you want to be the girl that goes to a basketball game with a with a whole cut out at the back of your t-shirt to expose your bum, and you feel like that that empowers you, you're gonna be twerking online all the time and doing whatever and, and embracing your sexuality. Cool, amazing, go do you. But there's also people out there who for whatever reason don't want to see that from you because they think you're too fat or they don't want to see that from you because they just don't want to see that um you know level of crudeness on their social media feed i think it's ridiculous i think it's nonsense i think people should be able to do what they want but i do know those people exist and to suggest that they are somehow being racist or they're bullying you because they're pointing out that they don't want to see that on their feed is just bizarre because you could easily just ignore those messages and keep on moving on but you know um let's continue it says um Bah, bah, bah. the native Texan noted that she was feeling especially frustrated because she's been working um, quadruple this time but feels that like unappreciated sometimes I feel like the world just don't love me back they shouldn't they don't need to, they're not obliged to love you no one is outside of your family and friends and again, what kind of love do you really want from being an international celebrity or international pop star? The love that you're getting is situational, circumstantial, temporary, fleeting. It's not real love, even if you're from your fans, right? They're only going to love you for as long as they're here. They're only going to love you for as long as you make great music. Do you know what I mean? The self-love has to come from within. You would imagine so, right? You would imagine. It continues. Um, it, it, it's like it doesn't matter how much positive energy you put out into the world. You're still going to have people who have something mean to say. Of course because it's the internet this is the nature of the internet internet is made for people to say shitty things to share 
you know, horrific videos and to just act a fool. It's not there to uplift you and give you positive light and energy. You're meant to cultivate that for yourself, however you do it, whether it's because, you know, you can cultivate your social media feed so you only follow people who are extremely positive. You can limit your use of social media. You can only limit your contacts and who you basically speak to in real life. There's things that you could do to ensure that you're not negatively affected by the drudgery and the bleakness of social media, but to expect to get love from strangers like that is just utter, utterly utterly bizarre it continues you still have people who sometimes i know to say and for the most part it doesn't hurt my feelings i don't care i just think um when i'm working this hard my tolerance gets low my patience gets lower i'm more sensitive and it gets to me if you're working as hard as you say you're working you really shouldn't have time to be checking people's feedback on the work that you're doing you should be focusing on the work but again these people they want to have their cake and eat it too they want everyone to listen to their songs but they also want everyone to share the same opinion of their songs or how they go about marketing and putting it out there because don't get me wrong this is a marketing push it's a bit callous it's a bit um it's a little bit uh, blatant at how she's doing it. We know it's a marketing drive, right? This whole idea that there's this really voluptuous, bigger girl doing a collaboration with Cardi B. Their two fan bases are, you know, they don't even, they don't operate in the same stratosphere, let alone in the same room. So in that respect, you, you know you're going to get some weirdness and some pushbacks and some trolls coming out from the blue. This is all part of the marketing push to turn it into like a, yay, let's, let's go after the bullies. It's like, no, you're a bit of an annoying personality on social media anyway, regardless if you're famous or not. You know that. You use it to your advantage. You know you're going to rub some people up the wrong way. The key to it is just to ignore it and keep on moving on because guess what? You're still a multi-millionaire, Grammy award-winning sing-songstress that hasn't put out when's the last time she put out a single was it like two years ago a year ago right and she still garnered all this attention right that should be a good thing you should be happy about that really you should think of well, it's what you should imagine so anyway it continues says um i think i'm just overwhelmed she says i think i've been in shock ever since the song came out and i haven't really been able to sit and just congratulate myself like i did well you should you should maybe pop a little you know have a little shot on yourself and pat yourself on the back and keep it moving i dropped a song i said everything i wanted to say i make music that i like that's important to me and i make music that hope uh people no sorry that i hope helps people period i'm not making music for white people i'm not making music for anybody i'm a black woman making music i make black music period i'm not serving anyone myself eh, let's be honest though you know most of your fans are going to be white it's not a bad thing but let's be honest in it let's get off the screen because the text messages are showing up on the screen um yeah i don't know i don't know what she wants um for the people that just always have something negative to say to me that has nothing to do with my musical content or my character or me as an artist just has everything to do with my body and whatever trope you think i fall into suck my from the back because all you motherfuckers are going to be the ones that are catching up they're not really are they you're never gonna come i don't know I don't really know. I strive for joy every day. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you know, she's just complaining. Look, man, I don't know. I think if you're a lizard, you're just going to have to accept you're not going to be everyone's cup of tea. It is what it is. Maybe it's because of what you look. I don't know. Who who knows what the point is? But the point of it is you're able to exist now in pop stardom world where people are quite image conscious and obsessed with what things look and sound like. And the fact that she can have a career, a very successful one, and be lauded by the industry and receive Grammys and awards and all this stuff and accolades, that should be enough. You shouldn't need to try and force the love from people that clearly are never going to love you for whatever bigoted reasons they have discriminatory reasons they have and just focus on the music focus on your fans but for whatever reasons people on this kind of level they always seem to focus more on the naysayers than they do their legions millions of fans who would literally give anything to spend a couple of minutes with them i just don't understand it but again maybe i'm in the wrong we move we move and um, what else I was thinking about? Oh, yeah, I was thinking about this. Noah. I was thinking about Noah, right? Noah's full 2021 collection has finally dropped online. And I don't know. Maybe it's just me. But does it feel like they're running out of ideas? Are they becoming a little bit uninspired? Or is it the fact that the current climate of like menswear, streetwear, whatever you call Noah, what they make at the moment, this kind of aesthetic that they've basically popularized and made be a, a normal quote-unquote thing other brands have kind of somewhat caught up or maybe done their own version of whatever style this is whether it's preppy whatever it may be and they are in some respects doing it maybe better or they've maybe 
found a way of kind of really you know driving home the point and kind of capturing the imagination of wherever kids buy this sort of stuff i don't really know because again there are some decent pieces in this full 2021 collection from noah that are obviously great and like i said um brendan B B brendan babazian is one of the i still think one of the leading figures when it comes to designing menswear i don't think he can be matched i think some people would argue ever since he left supreme they haven't necessarily ever recovered um i think a lot of the stuff in noah is timeless but it does have to be said when i kind of scan through the lookbook and i see the collection and the bits that they're putting out there that you know you could probably find stuff that marries up or is in the same level of like coolness dopeness or you know that looks nice when you go to brands like pop trading co you know you even brands like stussy like i mentioned previously they are doing so many good stuff now at the moment that it makes buying stuff from noah not redundant but it does make it a little bit more of a harder choice than it was prior like it's not such an insta cop anymore you have to maybe you know um ruminate over the decision to buy a cardigan from them because other brands you know even pleasures have pretty decent cardigans you know i mean that's a pretty run-of-the-mill straightwear brand so i don't know if it's everybody playing catch-up i don't know if it's the fact that noah have basically um rested on their laurels or they've run out of ideas but i do feel like this stuff isn't hitting as much as it would as it should be don't get me wrong these sort of like i don't know what print is it tartan hand suit this kind of print that noah does on their suit jackets is just brilliant the pants, the corduroy pants, you know, that corduroy short they did a few seasons back is excellent. They make good, they make great snapbacks. The collaborations on their shoes um, in general are really decent. This looks like a Dr. Martin to me. And if it is, wow, coming forward from a Noah, that'd be brilliant. This sort of like multicolor um, heavyweight flannel looks really nice. Great knits. And of course, the hoodies are always um, a kind of big seller in their collections. But overall, as a overall collection, I just feel like it's not hitting the same. You know, there's a collaboration here. It looks like with Adidas. That looks fairly interesting. I think there's another pair here somewhere that looked really cool sort of like a leopardy print colorway again you got those sort of boat shoes um i don't know what brands these are it's in the back of my head but it escapes me but they look pretty decent as well with the rose embroidery on the top but i don't know man it's just not hitting the same it really isn't and again is it because other brands are playing catch up or is it because they're resting on their laurels i have no idea but noah Four 2021 usually hit a lot harder and you got out your credit card and you were instantly buying another you know another jacket another pair of trousers a webbed belt or something of some sort i don't really know what the idea is but you know pretty clean collection like i said there's a lot of things in here that i would definitely buy like the suiting is just brilliant in it let's just let's just give a note on that they make really great suits very underrated in the suits that they make similar to Stussy in that regard people don't really look at them for it because i guess the suits are a little bit more of a relaxed fit and obviously it's coming from a streetwear brand if you're gonna buy a suit you might be tempted to just go to somebody that does it to high high level a high proficiency you don't really want to go to somebody that kind of dabbles in other things it's sort of akin to going into a burger shop and ordering a pizza you kind of want to go to a specialist but still if you're after the relaxed um look light comfy look then definitely a noah um a lower suit you wouldn't go amiss on that one because this looks incredibly incredibly cozy um very versatile wear too and of course the hoodies are always really not tastefully done this denim what, what they call it they call it a trucker jacket supreme called it right but this jacket is off the outfit is just 10 out of 10 in it green with a little diamond print on it and then you've got the it looks like i'm gonna say um you got the corduroy um what you call it you got the corduroy collar is it corduroy or, you call it, or is that like a new bucky satin i'm not too sure i think it's corduroy that would look better obviously with the green but that looks beautiful i don't know if it's reversible the jacket but it does look fucking fantastic so there's a lot of good stuff in here of course the knits from afar you can just tell they're gonna sit real nice on your little dome but i don't know man it just isn't hitting the same as it did in prior years maybe i'm just overlooking it and i mean over analyzing things but I don't know, it's just not hitting the same. Maybe I'm in the wrong. Let me know in the comments down below. Do you think Noah um, has fallen off or other people have caught up? Uh, those trousers, look at that. Brilliant, isn't it? Let me know in the comments down below. I'd love to know your thoughts, feelings, and suggestions. And again, if you've copped anything from this collection, also let me know as well. I'd love to hear your thoughts. 
ba ba biddy ba ba ba. Then we have news here, courtesy of Bloomberg. News has been absolutely shaking up the social media feed for the best part of 24 hours. It has now been confirmed, courtesy of Bloomberg, news that a lot of us were basically um, aware of. I know I was because I keep my eye and, and my finger on the pulse when it comes to you know uh, startup news and all that malarkey. Was that OnlyFans were trying to pivot away from being a platform for sexually explicit content and they wanted to pivot into just being a place for content in general because they were trying to raise investment so obviously you know if you're trying to raise a round of investment usually you're trying to expand into other areas you're trying to maybe increase your employee base maybe expand into different territories but you just a growth thing and if you can afford to not spend your own money spending the money of your investors to grow is usually a fail safe way and if your founders have a um a dream of maybe exiting soon a best way to go and exit is to get someone to buy you out and then slowly but surely um pull away um give up responsibility let someone else take some of your um, role and maybe back away into an advisory board until you basically get bought out completely and you can go on your merry way so news courtesy of Bloomberg confirmed says only fans to bar sexually specific videos starting in October. So this is the following only fans is getting out of the pornography business starting in October. The company will prohibit creators from posting material with sexually explicit content on its website, which many sex workers use to sell fans explicit content. They'll still be allowed to put up nude photos and videos and um, provided they're consistent with only fans policy. The company said on Thursday. So they're being purposely vague about what the new policy is, but they're saying you can still put content up there, but it's not going to be the level it is now because now it's a basically it's a free-for-all people are basically making money hand over fist there's you know every other day there's a story of some new girl who especially nurses i remember at the beginning of the pandemic there's always a story about a nurse usually the nurse that kind of did those videos where they basically were trying to um expose the truth about the conditions in hospitals and how serious of a threat covid was and they'd film a video of them you know selfie cam walking around the hospital maybe showing the the, the marks on their face from having to wear a face mask for so long and then eventually they'd get fired for maybe gross misconduct or whatever it may be and then they'd kind of find their way over to only fans and suddenly they're making you know a hundred thousand dollars per week or whatever it may be yeah stupid amounts of money um really really quickly and it always seemed to me at the time that re regardless of it still attracting a very um committed sex worker base i'd say right P um, women who obviously um live and breathe or people that live and breathe in that field i still always had the impression that it was always a temporary gig it never felt like to me it was like a long-term thing that you could kind of bank to have a career on only fans it always felt like a cash grab if you were one someone that wasn't you know um, shy about kind of burying yourself on the only fans and doing whatever needed to be to make some money then you could um but then once you get that money the idea i thought would have been to invest that into real world stuff or to put it into businesses or to put it into housing or get something whatever do whatever you need to do so that you can get as much value from that short period of time that you're on that platform as possible like you know essentially buy a car get a house stuff that you might be able to do later on if you end up getting a normal job but i never thought of it as like a career as like a long-term career it just didn't make any sense because in general especially when you consider all the other platforms especially content platforms out there usually they always start off a little bit um you know, all, you know, anything goes, you can do whatever you want on that platform. They gain the attention needed. They get the market share. Um, they obviously generate a lot of income sales. Um, they make people millionaires. And then little by little, as they're trying to grow, the things that they allowed when they first started are then things that they're going to have to ban in order for them to reach a new audience or to kind of get the investment of these corporate companies that don't want to be associated with things that they feel is a little bit um, dark or a little bit illegal, whatever it may be. Do you know I mean, that's why I always thought was the case because you saw it happening with patreon patreon is the same thing patreon had all these really edgy guys on there i think of the count daculars i think of the sargon of Akkads. i think of even something like a sam harris and shit talking about people's brain sizes right all this stuff those guys are on there making mount you know hundreds you know hundreds of thousands of dollars per month and shit and then suddenly little by little they all got knocked off of the platform because they were trying to obviously transition into whatever patreon is now at the moment so this was always on our cards i think if you were a girl or again if you're a sex worker on only fans i think you would be a bit naive naive to expect that this was going to last forever you should have basically made your money and cashed out i feel like they continue it says the popularity of social media service exploded during the pandemic as sex workers musicians and online influencers use it to charge fans of exclusive access to photos videos and other material only fans attracted more than 130 million users and it's so unique in it as a platform because if you think about it 
it's an e-commerce platform in some respects, but there's no browsing on OnlyFans. You don't browse. Unless somebody obviously has a profile where you can see stuff for free. But for the most part, there's no browsing. Any bit of content you want to check out, whether it's a written word, whether it's a piece of video, um, a, a, a picture of someone's lunch, you have to pay to see it. So I would imagine the average transaction or whatever that how you break it down it must be super high because everyone's buying they're not just browsing there is no putting into basket and thinking about where you're going to purchase it or not it's if you want to see this you have to pay if you want to read that you have to pay it's just amazing um it continues to the popularity also brought with it um additional scrutiny and only fans positioning itself more as a forum for musicians fitness instructions and, and chefs and sex workers while many of its most popular creators post videos of themselves engaging in sexual behavior several mainstream celebrities like Bella Thorne, Cardi B and Tiger have also set up accounts, but Tiger's posting his PP on there. That's when it leaks, isn't it? But I guess you would be, you'd be, out, you'd have to be furious. Again, I know what I'm saying. I think is right, but I still think if you're a sex worker and you feel like you help build that platform or you help build it to get to it to help it to get where it is you recommend it to all your friends you've got a nice ecosystem there great community that you've built up um a great way of working you must feel really betrayed a little bit right because essentially they're telling you to fuck off and you know they're now trying to attract the attention of all these other people or the other content creators that wouldn't want to be seen associated with only fans anytime anytime soon because if you're not only fans now i don't see why suddenly them getting investment and pivoting to something else is going to make you get only fans in the future right i'd imagine if you're on it now you're never going to be on it so it just feels a bit it feels like a bit of a, a slap in the face that they're not honoring the people that help to build a platform um by maybe you know building something a skeleton program a skeleton app that they can kind of segue those guys off onto another platform or something i don't know it just feels a bit uh, a bit horrendous and also the timing it's only october which is what next month or a couple of months away do you know what i mean like and suddenly you have to you know essentially think about getting a job or looking at your career prospects because they've taken away a large place a large source of income for you um it continues says the changes are needed because the mounting pressure from the banking partners and the payment providers, according to the company, OnlyFans is trying to raise money from the outside investors at a valuation of one of the one billion. See, now this is the one billion company. Do you remember, do you remember before when people were trying to say Clubhouse was a four billion dollar company valuation wise before it was going to go on IPO? Now, obviously, they maybe kind of you know reevaluated things because I was using the app as much as before. But if OnlyFans is valued at a billion. How can you ever justify or legislate for flipping Clubhouse being valued at four? It doesn't make any sense, does it? It says it continues says in order to ensure the long-term sustainability of our platform and continue to host an inclusive community for our creators and fans, we must evolve our content guidelines. The company is uh, run by its founder, Tim Stokely, and co-owned by Leonid um, Radinsky, an internet entrepreneur. The company has been praised for giving sex workers a safe space um, to do their job, but sex work still has a stigma. The company handled more than $2 billion in sales last year and is on pace to generate more than double this year, already more than four from two, Jesus Christ, it keeps um 20 percent of that figure only fans said it will still provide more guidance on its new policy later date the news disappointed some of the sex workers who've come to on to rely only fans it says here sylphie a 30 year old from dallas who declined to provide her real name began posting on only a few years ago and relies on the site to pay her bills she's wrote a few blogs on the company in the early days and even spoke to stokely but over the past year she noticed the company shifting its focus away from sex work and more towards other types of online creators um aping the similar move to the company like patreon earlier this year only fans introduced a new app that features many of its top creators but doesn't include any nudity it says if you look at the pro promos they don't promote us at all i noticed a huge drop in them promoting people who did sex work which again makes sense but it's actually quite frightening the influence some of these payment providers have on stuff that we post on the internet right platforms websites and whatnot it's actually crazy because if you want to process payments if you want to accept payments if you want to pe allow people to cash out you're going to have to you know get in bed with one of these payment providers whether it's a visa or whatever else people use in order for for you to make that work right if you're not willing to do the whole cryptocurrency blockchain thing you're gonna have to go the conventional route and these guys are basically the ones in charge of allowing you to basically have a business if without those payment providers without those payment platforms there are there's no possible people making money there are no high amounts of sales and there are no cash outs it's just a platform where people post content for free and that's gonna happen but you also feel like this is the blow that's definitely going to kill clubhouse 
Um, you feel like, you know, we've seen this happen plenty of times beforehand. Um, maybe not so aggressively as this. I think the most aggressive way we saw something really die off the back of stuff like this was when um, Tumblr basically banned, was it nudity or whatever is it? I think it was something like nudity or whatever. Tumblr got really... Um, kind of conservative and strict about the stuff that was posted on there which again negated the entire um base of people that were using it which were mostly angsty teenagers from around the world posting edgy things to get attention immediately when you change that you obviously kill the site and now you know tumblr is a flipping barren wasteland and the same thing can be said for only fans only fans was built off the back of sex workers without the sex workers there is no such thing as only fans the other people on there the entrepreneurs the ones that do the whole like flipping of the houses stuff they're still kind of i think building off the back of the sex workers um you know uh content that they place on there and the notoriety that that platform's given it and now with the change of services and terms and whatever it may be called it's just going to be the death nail really Really, if it was at the beginning or the end of it but again if you want investment and you value your company at a billion and you eventually do want to exit I, you can't really blame the founders for doing so because unfortunately in the current climate really at the moment the payment providers are the ones that are really the bosses the people that the amazon you know um web services all these places are the ones that basically dictate how and when people can conduct business but you know my heart does go out to the sex workers who are kind of unfairly being ditched to the one side but I, like i said before you should have had this in mind you should have thought this was going to happen sooner rather than later the good times were never going to last forever i don't think so um but you know you've made mo more money i think m they can't complain you've made more money than you could have ever imagined to have made people have bought houses they bought themselves teslas and stuff they've opened up businesses i I think if anything if you're able to have done that then fair play and if not these last few months are going to be a time to cash out even more and decide what you want to do in the future going forward i would imagine i would imagine let's move on let's move on what else we got to do here yeah this is courtesy of variety halle berry's in trouble halle berry's been hanging around um, the UFC scene a little bit too much recently. You see her always at the front row in certain cards. Maybe it's a WME link or whatever. I'm not really too sure. But um, afterwards, we did learn that she was filming a movie uh, about a single mother, I think, um, trying to get her kid back, you know, the standard of Halle Berry trope. And she was obviously getting into MMA in order to kind of get some money, get some notoriety and all that good stuff. And off the back of that, she was training with legendary MMA star Kat Zingano. But they've now got into a bit of PASA, which is interesting. It says here, yeah, Halle Berry suit by MMA star Kat Sangana over bruised film rose snub. So, you know, standard Hollywood scumbaggery, but unfortunately, Kat Sangana had to be one to suffer on the end of it. So, the following MMA star Kat Sangana has sued Halle Berry, alleging that she passed up a key UFC fight in order to appear in Halle Berry's film about mixed martial arts, only to be dropped from both the UFC and the film right absolutely horrendous right nightmare stuff Barry's film Bruce premiered in Toronto Film International Festival last year and it's used to come out on Netflix in November so you know it's going to be terrible I'm sorry Ali Barry I love you but you know this movie is, looks like it's going to be terrible um, Barry makes her directorial debut and stars as an MMA fighter also the single mother come on you know it's going to be shit she's directing starring in it as an MMA fighter come on in the suit Singano states that Barry asked her to appear in a film during a meeting in July 2019 the suit states that Barry noted um, the parallels between the script and Singano own life story a week later Zangano got an offer for the UFC to fight in October 2019 which would have put her in temptation for a title fight to be honest to be completely honest if you're Kat Zangano I think in general in life you should never kind of bank on things that haven't been you should never bank on the uncertain you should always bank on the certain so somebody is saying to you because you're employed by the UFC you're an independent contractor don't get me wrong but still they've given you a fight that might lead to a title fight you do the title fight you do the fight that might lead to a title fight you don't go to flipping Halle Berry and get flipping mesmerized by the Hollywood lights no you don't do that you go to what's certified the certified thing is your contract with the UFC you do the fight if you can work out a way for you to be in a film later you work out later but the fact that she had nobody in a corner to tell her this is quite concerning but then again goes to prove most MMA guys guys mma girls they have terrible people around them terrible from management to agents to trainers just garbage people i don't advise them in the right thing to do and some of them just happen to stumble into a great career and through just pure will and pure talent and strength they're able to kind of succeed and get to the top but it's not because of their team usually their teams are complete dog shit but it continues it says according to the suit barry todd zingano that for insurance reasons zingano could not do the both fight in the film what 
Zingano was torn between the significantly viable career advancing opportunity to fight in a title contention and a once in a lifetime opportunity to be involved in a defendant bearing a feature film about a character whose story was closely married to Zingano. Nah, 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 nah. You don't do that. What did Kat Zingano think was going to happen? Did she think she was going to play, she was going to be side by side with um, Halle Berry in the movie? If anything, she was going to have a little cameo and that would have been it. Like a little, oh, look, this one's for the heads. But she was never going to be in the movie like full stop. That's ridiculous. Like she got twanged. Um, Zingano um, informed the UFC that she would not participate in the UFC fight. The UFC then released her in August 9, 2019. Two weeks after that, Zingano allegedly, um, uh, two weeks after that, Berry allegedly told Zingano that she would not appear in the movie. Oh my God, because only UFC fighters could participate. Oh my days. Bay then cut off communication with Zingano, who let her side with Bellator MMA. Zingano states the claim of a promissory estoppel, arguing that she relied on Barry's promise to include in the movie when she turned down a deal from the UFC. Barry's representative did not um, respond to comment. Of course they did it. That is a scum. That's the most Hollywoody scumbag thing I've heard in a long time. But again, are you surprised? Not really. I don't think anybody should be banking on the promise of Halle Berry that you're going to appear in a movie. She might have said that when she was high. She might have said that when she was happy. She might have said that after she just trained with you doing a couple of flipping rounds in the gym hitting a heavy bag the endorphins are flowing feeling good yeah i'm gonna put you in my movie man you're gonna be a star you're gonna be a star but when it when it comes comes around to it things change but the idea that she told she was told to not appear in the in not not to fight on that fight card that might have led to a title fight in the hopes of doing the movie but then when she goes to do the movie they say that she can't appear there because she's been dropped by the ufc it's like oh get off of here man absolutely nonsense absolute nonsense Let's move on, let's move on, let's move on. What else do we have here? What else do we have here? Let's move on. Let me double check the time and see if everything is going well. Yes, it is. Let's mm -mm. double check the time. Bear with me. Let's make sure things are going well here. Hold on. Bear with me one second. Hold on. Yeah, there we go. And then, what's, oh yeah, and then next year, next news, what we got. This is a bit of a, just a tiny thing I saw pop up on my feed that I thought was hilarious. Because, you know, ultimately, you know, I don't care what people do with their money. It's, you're free to do it with it as you please, especially if you make it through the sweat of your brow as I'm sweating right now. But this kind of puts on my feet. This guy called Hassan Piker, right? He's one of these kind of um, talking people on Instagram. Oh, sorry, these people that talk about politics and shit on Twitch and whatnot. I think he's loosely associated with Young Turks, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not sure if he's part of it, but I know he's related to the main guy, the big kind of dude on there. But basically, um, news kind of went across social media that this guy, Hassan Piker, has bought a, what, $2 million, $3 million, a pretty, you know, expensive mansion somewhere in the Hollywood Hills, as most people in LA do, right? Makes complete sense. The place itself looks absolutely beautiful. Um, I think there is images I'm going to show you later that of the actual inside of what it looks like on the outside. It looks really, really lovely. Um, 2.74 says here, Twitch phenomenon, Hassan abby talks and talks his way into hollywood home which is a pretty funny headline so all in all no problem right but i think the thing that people are really having a laugh over is that this guy is known to be a famed socialist um somebody who believes in taxing the rich or quote-unquote killing the rich and here he goes buying a 2.74 million dollar house with absolutely little to no irony that it was only a few weeks or yeah, maybe a few months ago that he was spotted wearing this t-shirt that says make the rich pay with the A on the pay and you know the anarchist symbol um obviously taking into a fact that he's you know, of his kind of socialist ideals it's just hilarious that these things happen and most of the time i don't really have an issue with this kind of thing i don't really care the only thing that really interests me when it comes to this sort of hypocrisy online is that i would love it if somebody had the opportunity to sit down and just ask him like don't you think it's somewhat hypocritical to be talking about taxing the rich but then you're also part of the rich because you know there's you know you have to be part of the one percent to be able to afford a mansion that cost you 2.74 million in west hollywood right um all to yourself it's a massive place he doesn't have any kids i don't think he doesn't have a wife or whatnot so he's got this incredible place that he's obviously worked incredibly hard to get 
Um, but then he's also the same person that's really we're ready and willing to say make the rich pay, tax the rich, and they should be redistributing their wealth to people you know with less means and all this malarkey. And it's like, have you redistributed any of your wealth to people with less? Um, are you going to house the homeless in this massive, great looking mansion? Like, I would like to know, will you do a soup kitchen in this great open floor kitchen thing that you have here at the moment? Probably not, innit? And that's fine. That's okay. But it's just the hypocrisy of it. Telling people to do one thing and then you're doing the complete opposite the other way. It's like that other girl too, right? Who was it? That Bernie girl that was, you know, again, doing the whole like socialism thing on her regard. And then she goes out and buys this amazing flat penthouse somewhere in, in New York, this great BMW. And she don't really get the hypocrisy of it whatsoever. You just feel as if people are hating on you. It's like, it's not hate. People could just call out your hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is just funny to laugh at and point at from afar. But that mansion itself is flipping lovely to look at, to be fair. It's very, very nice. Very For once, I guess, maybe because someone else lived in it previously, it is very homely, right? It doesn't look sterile like some other mansions. It does look like, you know, a home that you can essentially hopefully build a family with or, you know, have your friends live with you or whatnot. It's fucking gorgeous. Look at that bathroom. His and her loot, who's in her sinks, massive shower there, a great bath, like, oh, absolutely fantastic. Really, really nice. Even got a pool outside, of course, like most of these LA mansions have a pool where you can go cool down. Hopefully, it's got a sauna somewhere that you can go and sit in as well. Really nice. Don't get me wrong. Very, very nice. Um, he deserves every little piece of it because, again, he's one of these guys that streams for like hours online talking about politics again and again and again. I can't imagine anything worse. But for himself, congratulations. He deserves it. But it is quite ironic. But again, what do I know? Let's move on. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about this. This is interesting. Let's talk about this because the rave doesn't stop. So interesting news from within the techno space techno scene the space the scene the culture whatever it may be very interesting events over the last few days or whatnot so over the last few days this guy called nicholas rose on instagram basically detailed a very disturbing experience that he had partying at the now um, newly minted river sudus how you pronounce it riviere sudus which is now the new version of greece Milo, which cues closed sometime last year and you know it's been met with a lot of um, great feelings everyone's had a lot of great things to say about it great write-ups um not really seen the inside of it of course with um, berlin's or germany's famed no pictures no photo policy but from their programming and the way they're approaching stuff and it's th and the fact that most of the original greece Mueller team moved over to river studios you would assume that they would kind of you know launch this place it would be a great safe space for people to go and rave and do their thing but this guy nicholas is basically accusing um um, the complete opposite of what happened there right and he's basically posted a couple of days ago or maybe a few days ago on his instagram story the following he says today i'm coming forward publicly um, with my experience of racism homophobia from the new greece Miller crew i had the most traumatizing experience and i must speak i have always spoken up about discrimination and what went through early monday morning was nothing short of an experience being targeted stay tuned and i don't know what that word is at the end i guess it's a german word that's what he basically put out there and um, for the most part, I've only heard good things about Greece Müller. Sorry, about the new Greece Müller, right? The River Sudos. I've not really been there, of course, myself due to pandemic. I haven't been able to go to Berlin and do my regular yearly trip over there. But for the most part, I've only heard really good things. The only other negative I've heard from afar has been the um, the, the kind of lack of volume in there because i guess it's near a residential area or maybe because they're doing open air parties i think after a certain time they have to limit the sound or there's a limiter on it or for the entire duration of the event but whatever that's the only thing i've really heard i've not even heard anything bad about the queues everyone's kind of got in pretty well i've not heard anything else you know negative about it. so this is the first time i've heard specifically a bad story pertaining to it so let's hear what he has to say himself and the video itself is fairly long it's 13 minutes i won't play the whole thing but this is um nicholas uh, posted a igtv video statement on his instagram page basically detailing the entire experience um i'll read the caption it says my awful experience at river sudas this is my experience from the last time there at the new greece miller at the cyanide event which is something we need to keep on uh, mind the cyanide event it says i will not tolerate any racism homophobia or hyper masculine energy and you shouldn't either the pain i feel is real i won't give up and i'll continue to stand up for people like me in berlin and beyond you be better believe it this is real and happening in what is supposed to be the most open-minded city in the world show me the receipts after show me the receipts after 
outer was it outer outer racism thrives in violence and silence share your experience i'm with you and always stand with you right so let's play um a little bit of the video and then i'll give you my thoughts after so today i'm going to talk about my experience at the new police mula at the sinoid party uh a few days ago it was disgusting what i dealt with and i think that it's very important that as many people as possible hear what i went through and experienced because based on my identity and just who i am i've experienced a lot of things that the average cis white person probably wouldn't even have nightmares about experiencing i wrote out a little bit of some notes to a little bit dramatic but we get the point I'll just keep things in proper chronological order and i'm going to keep it pretty cut and dry so you get the facts and it's up to you to decide how you feel about it so between the hours of 3.15 and 4.15 a.m. on August 15th, going into the next day, I attended Sinoid at Glismila. It was fun the first several hours, and around the hour of 4 a.m., it became very fucked up. As they were very strict about masks, and that's understandable, the way in which they treated me was nasty and unexplainable. As I stood in line for the bathroom to obtain water after dancing several hours, I was approached by one of the crew, and I told I was not wearing my mask properly. As he said that I responded and I haven't even taken off my mask at all. He replies that it needs to be a little bit more up. And I explained to him that my nostrils weren't even showing in the slightest. It's pretty much like this. The mask entailed, uh, it went a little bit further down my nose, uh, simply to the point of my nostrils. At that moment, a little bit confused, I replied, okay, I don't see what the issue is, but uh, please explain because it's still in my face. To which he replied, if you wish to drink anything, you have to be sitting down. And my response was, I have been dancing for three hours straight, and I asked if it would be okay if I sat down in this particular spot on the ground and uh, have some water there. He says, okay. So I go ahead and I sit down on the ground to take my water, and I think at this moment he may have taken it as a joke. So I stand up to finish my drink of water before I walk off, and at that moment he opens up a conversation with my friends in German, completely excluding me, which does also tend to happen out here. I say to them, can you translate this conversation to me because I don't know what's going on right now. He ignores me and walks away. I, I talk to my friends and they say, you know, they don't think he's very happy that you uh, sat down and drank your water. So just be patient for a second. Uh, all of a sudden, he brings this very big, heavy, cis, German, white dude over to me and asks me if I can speak German or English. I said, I don't speak German. I only speak English and I would appreciate it. If you can continue to speak English for the duration of this conversation because uh -oh. your other colleague is excluding me purposely from a conversation that I know is directly about me. Refusing to speak English and then also knowing fluently how to speak English is crazy to me. <laughs> he says to me, listen, I don't care. I'm going to ask you a simple question again. Do you speak English or German? So I respond and listen. Uh, I respond saying, uh, listen, dude, do you not hear me are you not listening to what i just said he said yeah i heard you uh -oh. uh, but answer the question and i said well i speak english uh oh he says well you're wearing your mask inappropriately and we have noticed that this is an issue you need to wear your mask properly or there will be consequences i said listen dude my mouth anyway you get the point right so if we're being honest i think this entire situation is a great ill illustration or example of how spoiled people are in berlin when it comes to clubbing which is great it's a good thing actually think of it it's a good thing because the good thing is is that these guys are so not used to being accosted or pulled up or harassed on the dance floor by security or anybody pertaining to the club that any kind of affront especially during the pandemic times when it comes to the pacific has to come with masks which are basically is part of the law right if they don't um enact the law or make people put their mask on and they can't do certain things it's going to affect their license so they they are basically incentivized and it's basically within their best interest to make sure that they are making people abide by the law but even under these times they still feel really 
it's like on the personal front when somebody taps you in the shoulder and tells you, hey, put your mask on higher because you don't want anyone touching you anyway because you're so used to clubbing in Berlin where as long as you get past the security and you're able to get past the door picker, you're basically fine to do exactly what you want, right? Whether it's pissing on someone's face or fucking someone in a dark room, you're free to do what you want. Sexual liberation, carefree, no pictures, no video. You get to enjoy and, and, you know, all your, you get to basically enjoy all your fantasies, rave, dance, do whatever you need be, head nod, chin chin scratch whatever you can do it over there with little to no interruption but this is standard practice here in the uk or in london specifically and i think in general in pandemic times you would imagine he should be a little bit more forgiving to the idea that maybe people are going to be a little bit more tense especially considering that they might have had you know um situations where neighbors have basically petitioned that they're going to take away their license and the fact that we're living again in such a tense time people are going to be a little bit on edge and your raving experience might not be as carefree and as loose as you'd want it to be sorry you want it to be because we're living in pandemic times and if you do want that carefree sort of do what you want um atmosphere then maybe go to a legal party but again you've run the risk of maybe contracting covid and whatnot so i know where the, the risk remain but also if you go back to that the kind of core of this issue it was that little tete tete he had with the bouncer or whoever it is that came up to him that essentially caused a problem and any place I've been, any club, any place, usually for the most part, if you get yourself into an argument with the security, usually you lose. There is no scenario I've ever been, regardless of the club, regardless of the country, where I've ever got into some sort of argument or back and forth, an answering back session with a security or a door picker or a bartender even sometimes, right? When you're getting a little bit too loose and you're getting, you think you're being funny to a bartender, but clearly you're annoying them and they get someone to tell you to sort off, right? It can happen when you get too drunk or you're too high. It never ends well when it comes to you, the patron, going in there. So most of the time you should behave yourself and whatever the security or the bouncer or the the door picker says usually goes because you want to make sure that you can stay in this club for as long as possible because you pay the entry free the last thing you want is to get chucked out because of a little miscommunication you had in the toilets especially when it comes to just putting your mask on put your mask on shut up and you wouldn't have had an issue completely now i do understand the other side of things where he feels like he's been picked on because i've had that things happen to me too where for whatever reason you are the person that they want to go and search really deeply you're the person that they want to go and check the toilet cubicle of you're the person you know i mean it can be it can sometimes feel a little bit like you're being harassed like somebody is basically keeping their eye on you from afar when everyone else is doing just as bad or maybe worse as you in the club itself but again i don't care because i've purposely gone there to go and rave i've not gone there for anything else i've not gone there to see that person or to see that security guard i've gone there essentially to listen or to see a dj play i've gone there to go and dance i've gone there to go and lose myself to maybe celebrate something to maybe cap the end of a week whatever it may be i want to ensure that i'm on my best behavior as possible to ensure that i can stay in that place that's it and i think going back and forth with a security guard going back and forth with the bouncer is always going to lead to the situation where you get involved in the back and forth and who knows maybe be in that back and forth the person that came over to you might have said something that could be related to homophobia that could be deemed as racist or whatever it may be but i have a hard time believing that a club of this caliber um with the reputation that it has and the fact that the previous club greece Mueller, had one of the most legendary queer night clubs or sorry um club nights there in um um in cocktail de amour right um which i went to once and which i specifically went to to berlin to go visit once before which i didn't get in that time i read an article by daniel wang that he wrote for electronic beats a few years ago it's a fantastic essay if you can find it definitely check it out and it basically spoke about how amazing grease Mueller was as a partner to this collective that put on this party in grease Mueller called cocktail de amour where it's a basically a celebration of the queer lifestyle and it was an amazing place right they only had good things to say about it like a long-standing event they, only, they recently i think had their first event at the new river sudus recently too or maybe a uh, second third I'm, I'm not too sure but i just find it difficult to believe that a club that is so kind of closely linked to the queer scene in berlin would also be the same place that's going to be racist and homophobic to somebody especially in the pandemic times especially when it comes when you kind of go to anticipate of the core of the argument which was that he didn't have his mask on properly again i know it's annoying i know it's intrusive I know you don't want somebody coming up to you and touching you and do whatever, I know. But in general, we are living in different times. You just have to conduct yourself differently when it comes to going out in a club. It just is what it is. But it just show how detached and how foreign it is for people in Berlin to be raving 
and for them to have security guards come up to them because you know if, if you're from london you'd know there's always time on an occasion where someone will come by with a flashlight right as you're raving somewhere to check if people's hands and make sure people are not doing bumps on the dance floor there's always security walking around there's always the presence of security you just learn to kind of you know ignore it as you're raving but when you go to the countries like or you go to places like berlin you know and they and they kind of take clubbing very seriously they are very um they are very hell bent on providing a somewhat safe space so that as soon as you pass those doors and you've gone past the search and you've been you know frisking need, you know where need be and you got your stamp you are free to do whatever you want but for some reason you know people haven't necessarily adjusted to this new reality of being at the moment and i think towards the end he mentioned something about being chucked out on the street naked and only having a fong on because he wasn't able to get his stuff in the cloakroom which again un it's an unfortunate event but you know no one told you to go to a club with a fong on you went with a fong on because you felt like you were safe that's something to note you're not going to go to a club like that dress the way he is and being safe and you know being expressive and living your best life if he didn't feel somewhat safe so he did that and of course when you get chucked out of a nightclub unfortunately it's never done in a correct manner it's never done in a very logical way you don't get the chance to say bye to your friends or pick up all your stuff you're just done in the very just get the fuck out of here because usually it's off, it's off the back of some sort of argument or indiscretion that you've done so that shouldn't really be something that you should be beating over the head too much I do feel like this could have been dealt with in a better way but again everyone's got their fitness to go through so that was the video obviously complaining about or it's kind of stating what happened then came the statement from from river Sudus, which i don't think was the best statement in the world this is the first statement i think this probably made matters far worse than it needed to be so the first statement that they put out was first of all thank you for the taking time and attention to engage us with such a sensitive manners your feedback oh no is this the first one or is that the first one what's the first no this is the first one yeah this is the first one that was the other one the first one is this one i think so i think so yeah, this is the one. The first one was update on the current situation on last Saturday at River Sudus. It says, after we became aware of the incident yesterday from our social media, we contacted Nicholas and are in direct dialogue. Internally, we are dealing with the matter with the utmost urgency and in communication with our team. The staff involved in the incident have been suspended by us until the matter is closed, which I thought was crazy, right? I thought for having a little tete-a-tete -tete with a security guard um, and whatever was said in an argument gets said in an argument, but for you to then take that to social media and kind of use it as a battering ram to basically denigrate the entire club and basically throw into question their entire you know existence and then have somebody suspended i think was ott i think if again if it was me and i felt personally offended or affronted you could have easily dm'd them emailed them gone to them the next day and spoken directly and if you didn't reach a resolution that way then of course air them out on social but for someone to get suspended off the back of a argument that people have you know i'm sure security or bouncers have arguments with patrons and customers or clubs all the time especially if you're inebriated or high I guess it happens all the time for it to be a situation where you get suspended from it, especially at a place where, you know, people take those jobs kind of seriously. It's a whole economy out there, infrastructure and whatnot. It does feel a little bit over the top, but I guess they needed to do something in order to kind of push back from some of the negative reaction online. And it continues, it says, the next slide, it says, there is no space of discrimination, racism, homophobia, transphobia, or queerphobia, river sudus, that's how you pronounce it, river sudus, or sodost, however you say it, um, Rivier, let's, let's, let's leave it at that. It says, the concerns and interests of minorities and marginalized groups are very important to us. We protect, support, and the community beyond the club activities. In order to enable and maintain the safe space, we are taking the currently applicable corona measures, in particularly mask obligations very seriously, which is true, right? I think of every other, posts i've seen them advertising nights they've always been very strict and very forthright about making sure everyone knows you have to wear your mask or your mask or your mask pcr tests whatever it may be lateral flow test they're very very pushy with that over there in germany it makes complete sense but in that entire essay you didn't see a sorry you didn't see it they didn't really apologize in any way shape or form so i think people naturally felt a little bit affronted by it and obviously you can see a, a kind of very popular instagram profile um called running order berlin one of the first comments says how many staff members did you quote unquote suspend please be precise and write a real apology tell us who you will make sure the aggression will stop how will you educate the remaining staff blah blah blah, blah. people are really angry right and then they came back with a second reply to basically counteract some of the negativity they were getting online and said the following first of all thank you for taking the time and attention to engage us with your sensitive matter your feedback will not be ignored and furthermore such pressing issues will not be um, solved with a statement so i guess they realized you know they couldn't necessarily 
get away with a wishy-washy reply because essentially they're talking to their customer base right they're talking to people who they want to come and attend their club and the fact that there's no tourist you can't really afford to piss off people who live there and want to rave because if they decide to boycott your club your club is done because there's no tourist to kind of make up for those numbers so they basically went back to the drawing board and put a statement that was a little bit more forgiving it says this for those reasons we have suspended all club activities right so if it wasn't bad enough that he got some a person suspended from their job because they got into an argument that turned in that got rude or whatever maybe he now has resulted in the club suspending all their activities for the foreseeable future which kind of prevents certain DJs from being able to get paid it prevents people from being able to get paid and work bartenders security uh, people that work in the cloakroom like this is how it's negative because of your one experience that is what you call entitlement I think in my opinion again there is occasions where you just have to get your story out there if you've been physically harmed there's something egregious but i just think in this regard a miscommunication maybe male energies getting the best of people too much sass whatever it may be it doesn't equate or it doesn't i think justify this level of response making that kind of video was in my opinion was a little bit insane especially if you haven't reached out to the club themselves directly and now look what's happened you made one person lose their job and I'm sure people in the local scene know who that security guard is who you argued with. So that person's been, you know, they've got now a black mark over their head and now you've suspended the entire club activities for a foreseeable future, negatively affecting all the artists that are going to perform there and the people that work there during the pandemic when people have been without a job and without a purpose and without a place to go and connect and vibe with their community. I just think it's insane. It continues. It says this weekend in order to fulfill, to fully concentrate on assessing and solving these issues. All tickets already purchased for the weekend will be automatically refunded imagine the amount of money that they're having to refund money that they haven't been able to make for i don't know a year or so consistently then having to refund automatically because they feel like they have to solve this issue behind the scenes because they know long term if they don't get this right then it could negatively affect the club going forward god almighty we understand that those subject matters reaching much further than our club and the solutions will not be found in short-term thinking but let us be clear we are aiming for new standards and hoping to become an ex uh, an exemplary force in leading the way forward which is honorable right there is something honorable about it but the fact that they're having to sacrifice themselves off the back of somebody's argument one person had an argument had a falling and again it wasn't the whole crew from what i remember from the video he got chucked out and his friends didn't even go with him he just got chucked out on his own which says a lot about his friends anyway right look at your friendship circle in that regard but it wasn't like his whole entire crew got discriminated against it was his one experience that he had unfortunately it does happen sometimes you cross the paths with the wrong person in the club and suddenly your night goes from being the best night in the world to the worst it can happen at times but is that a real justification to denigrate the entire club to make it seem as if they have an issue with people of your ilk completely and to make it seem as if they're transphobic when again they're one of the leading forces and again they have one of the most famous well-known club nights hosted within their club that has a you know, long-standing legacy and relationship with them it just seems utterly utterly unfair it continues as we're fully aware of the challenges ahead of us and we wish to express our most sincere apologies for all inconvenience and trauma and pain we have caused and the other thing that made me think as well that way it's unfair because if you think about this this is mostly a cyanide problem and if I'm not mistaken, again, from afar, I'm speaking from London, but the times I've kind of wanted to go there, whenever I've read comments and stuff about them launching events and putting stuff out there, I've always seen people moan about the treatment they've received and they went to a sign party regardless of where it's hosted because I'm sure it's been at different places. Um, they've complained about not being able to get in They've complained about not being able to buy tickets. I think they do that a lot. Sometimes where they'll put out they'll put out a adv advertisement that says the tickets are going to launch at 9 a.m. But then the tickets launch at 7. They sent their friends a link prior and they all get sold out before they're able to go and get general release. So there's always been a little bit of skullduggery, a little bit of shiftiness, a little bit of weirdness that's associated with that side note pie. But I guess because they're the cool kids, they're like, you know, they're like yeah they're basically the cool techno kids that everyone wants to be associated with people kind of don't really say too much because they want to get to the next party they want to be able to get on the next list on the next guest list for the next rave wherever they put on but it is kind of unfair that all this blame is being placed mostly on the new grease Müller and not on the promoters who put on that party who basically in my opinion 
are the ones that created an atmosphere that led to that tense exchange happening between Nicholas and whoever that security guard was. That's what I think generally happened. I don't think it was a specifically just a River Sudos thing. I don't think a Riviera Sudos. I don't think it was. I think it was mostly to do with the Synod party. But again, no mention of them has been made really for the most part. It's mostly been done mostly to the club. And I'd be like, come on, man. Because everyone complains about Synod. Everybody complains. Tickets, the people, the DJs being too high and special stage. I'm not going to name any names. People complain about those guys all the time. And now they're specifically laying the blame at them. And I just, honestly, I just can't understand the entitlement that would lead you to go to a place where you want to have the complete club shut down. And now people are not able to make money. It just, I don't know. It's just insane. It really is insane. Surely they could have had a conversation behind closed doors in private and they come to some sort of resolution. Surely, right? You'd think so. You'd think so. But anyway, here we are at the moment. River Sudis is, I guess, going to be closed for the foreseeable future. It says here in a statement. Um... Da, da, da. Yeah, what this says at the end. Um, may this be a tipping point and an example for the new standard. May our house be a house for all once again. We hope to reopen our club soon, but please understand we might need a bit of time. It'd be funny if they make that as a statement or a little phrase they put on a t shirt. May our house be a house for all once again. That'd be funny, raising money for a specific charity or whatnot. But I don't know. I just think it's gr way OTT, super over the top. I understand sometimes you can have really terrible experiences, especially if you're somebody from the LGBTQ community. I'm sure you have to be keenly aware of where you basically go and rave to ensure you have safe experiences. But it's hard to justify um, or to legislate or to believe that a very prominent club like this is going to be homophobic or, or racist. It's just hard to, to make that make sense, especially when you see the people who are booked there, the people that work there. It just doesn't make any sense. But I, I can understand it can be different reality over there because I'm not there. I'm not there daily. I only visit, you know, every year so and so. So I'm sure there's more things that, to it. But it's just sad to see a situation where effectively people who have been out of a job, who have been without that community of going to a dance, uh, well, what a nightclub for the for lack of a better term, are now going to be without it because of one person's shit experience. It just seems grossly unfair to me. But again, maybe I've been wrong. Let me know in the comments down below. Anyway, that's it. Episode number 486. Thanks so much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company. I'm going to leave you now because I don't want the computer to die on me. So if it's your first time tuning in, click like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. And of course, share the show with your family and friends. And I'll see you guys again very soon. Take care. Peace.